We are in Africa, and this is Morocco. The GPS coordinates, found on the SD card that my friend Alex had left us in Corsica, brought us as far as this golden sand dunes in this beautiful country. Obviously, there's no sign of Alex. Sixty days have passed since we've left Corsica, and we have been traveling for over three days now. We are tired. Enough. We're giving up and heading home. We have crossed almost the whole of Morocco to reach this place. Smashed me apart as if you're not dead. I have joined a couple of African expert friends for this trip, and I will now tell you everything about our way. Back from Marzuga, a village down south, close to the borderline with Algeria to Tangier, where we'll board the ferry that will take us back to Italy. The selected route is not very challenging in itself, but indeed it's much fun. We have chosen a mixed itinerary, traveling between dirt roads and sand tracks, visiting typical Moroccan villages. It's almost impossible not to stop and enjoy the view from this promontory near Mazuga. I now know why the Marathon de Sable, the famous 250 km marathon in the desert, ends here. It's the 31st of December, and we've decided to celebrate the end of the year between these sand dunes in a small oasis with palms and acacia trees. We are immediately faced with an unexpected event mostly because, despite being winter, it is very hot and it's very easy to sink the thin, overheating sand. Alberto and Sabrina's 4x4 got brought down until almost halfway through the wheel, and it's me who's got to pull them out. Without having had the opportunity of deflating the tires, and with the massive weight loading the 4x4, it was an inevitable but quite fun circumstance. We chose to use the winch, a powerful electric engine mounted on the front of the 4x4 that allows a quick and easy retrieve. I comfortably sit at the driving position and trigger the command managing the retrieval maneuvers, careful not to overexert the cable. While Alberto gives traction, I pull the 4x4 out. As occurred during our retrieving maneuvers, the 4x4 might transverse, waiting on the winch to a greater extent. To avoid burning it out, make sure you do not overexert. If stuck in the sand, it is best to throttle away in first gear low. And if the situation is not too bad, as in our case, you will soon get it out in adherence. Our journey continues towards Merzuga in search of the other members of the caravan, so as to join in for the end of the year celebrations and organize ourselves for dinner. Some kids from the nearby village are waiting on the beautiful golden dunes to welcome us. Lutien has her own way of saying hello. Once the 4x4 and the tents are fixed, we enjoy a quiet sunset and light the fire to keep us warm during the night. My friends release three colored sky lanterns they have brought from Italy as a good omen for the new years to come. On January 1st, after having dismantled the tents, we head towards our first destination, the city of Risani. 
there is a characteristic outdoor market operating three days a week where you can buy bread, fresh fruit and vegetables. Lutien is always by my side, also when we walk through the market, but she often gets frightened or irritated by the many new noises and smells. Mix di odori e profumi spezie. Approaching the heart of the souk, this is how the market is called in Africa, we buy a few souvenirs. Spagnolo, italiano, francese. Capiscono tutto in verità, basta farsi capire a volte anche a gesti. Bellissimo. If you're good at haggling, you can do some big business. I'm really nuts at this. Posso provare un cappello? C'è solo rosso? Blu. Ah, meglio, ecco. Quanto costa? 80 dirham. 80 dirham. Va bene, 80 dirham. 80 dirham il cambio è 10 dirham sono più o meno un euro, quindi 8 euro, insomma. Ho le garo per la mia nipotina. Questo è piccolo. 120 dirham. 120 dirham. Quindi 120 più 80 200 dirham. 200 dirham. 200 dirham. 200 per la rossa. Ok? Ok, tutti e due mi li fa 200 dirham, sono 20 euro. Direi che ci sta. Oh, merci. Questo non lo vendo per 100 dirham. Ah, 100. Per 100 dirham, non ho un problema regalo. Ce l'ho regalato per 10, okay. 10 euro. Okay. Merci, eh, mon ami. Merci, au revoir. As usual, I couldn't bargain at all. Oh well, I did manage to buy a few gifts anyway. Before leaving, we stop at a service station for fuel and water, and I have a chat with Mohammed, the patrol pump attendant. Following our previous experience, I regulate the tire pressure. Ready to tackle the next sand route. Lutien is always there, giving me a leg. We proceed towards Zagora, a small town in southern Morocco, willing to follow some routes beginning here. But another unexpected event occurs. While driving, I hear a loud noise coming from under the chases and I promptly come to a halt. Eh, ragazzi, mi è caduto un ammortizzatore, porca boia. Penso sia caduto solo il perno che lo tiene, eh, però non ne sono sicuro, adesso guardo bene. A nut has literally unscrewed from its bolt, letting the bonding of the shock observer out and leaving the shaft hanging down. Luckily enough, the readiness in coming to a halt has prevented a more serious damage, the complete loss of the shock observer. Alberto and Max helped me to lift the 4x4 using a floor jack, a handy device used to lift very high vehicles. The sand and dust on the ground aren't helping, and the floor jack suddenly unlocks itself, making Async, my 4x4, drop at once, damaging the rear license plate light. Fortunately enough, nobody got hurt. To secure repair, we change the floor jack fastening position on the side of the 4x4, then I take the necessary spare parts to fix everything and improvise myself mechanic. Just as a matter of interest, before leaving, I did check the 4x4 for technical problems in order to have a safe, hassle-free trip. Supposedly, we must have forgotten to tie a few knots and bolts to fasten the shock observers to the chases, and more specifically, the left rear one. The way to Zagora is exactly how I imagined it. Mixed, fast on rocky routes and slow on sand paths. I took async almost to the limit throughout the whole path, enjoying myself immensely all the way. Driving on sand is challenging and you should not let the vehicle sink. Always drive at a certain speed to make sure the vehicle floats on the sand and avoid overturning along the slow tracks where the dunes are stretching for kilometers. Lutien prefers longer stops, allowing her time to drink, stretch and noise around. It is very important to keep her well hydrated when the temperatures are high. We have to bear in mind that it's winter time in Italy and her coat is thick. Several hours later, we finally reach Zagora, a mandatory stop for I 4x4, which after hundreds of miles are in need for a checkup. We meet Mohamed El Gordito, 
he owns an incredibly furnished workshop and has a team of young mechanics who immediately surrounded Async, checking it thoroughly, and spot a few little problems that I hadn't even noticed. Some parts of the movement are worn out, creating a slight but serious problem to the alignment. Le crociere degli alberi, le giunture di movimento che con la sabbia si, si riempiono di polvere e sabbia, chiaramente dopo un po' non lavorano bene o si rovinano di più, allora vanno ingrassate spesso. Tu là, tu le pièce a changer parce que je le cassé. Ci facciamo cambiare anche il, la luce della targa che si è rotta quando è caduta la binda per alzare la macchina. Ci è andato anche l'adesivo ufficiale. ufficiale. Abbiamo comprato un dado sostitutivo per l'ammortizzatore 10 dirame un euro più o meno lo paghiamo in Italia lo paghiamo lo stesso modo 10 giusto? 10? grazie andiamo su di qua non c'è modo di arrivare là 180 once the vehicles have been repaired we plan our future stop the next camp will be set just before dusk in an oasis in the middle of nowhere We reached the chosen spot just after sunset and I stopped to observe the wreck of an old 90s 50s Landover 109 while my friends look for a perfect place for our overnight camping. Strano che ha lasciato il volante ancora. Va bene, facciamo campo qui. Questa è un'oasi in mezzo al nulla. C'è anche l'acqua, c'è una sorgente qua. Dormiamo qua stanotte? Mm? Ok? An oasis is a small piece of desert, partly covered with vegetation, which is formed thanks to a small basin of water accumulating in the soil. Human settlements can be developed around the oasis, which may also serve as rest area for travelers. The Berber people inhabiting this part of the desert used to exploit it also for living and farming. I park async in a convenient position for camping, and before preparing dinner and setting up the tent, I have time to play around with Luthien. She is traveling inside the boot of the Defender all the time and she really needs to play. I throw an object a long distance away so that she can run to it and sometimes stick it back. I know this is not typical of wolves, nevertheless she loves it so much I can read the happiness on her nose. The evening is coming, the temperature is falling and soon we will reach zero degrees. Lutian has the fur to keep her warm, but we should better sleep inside our sleeping bags. The fire certainly does help keeping us warm, but it also helps relaxing and dispersing the fatigue accumulated during the day. I stare at the fire for hours, and apparently so does Luthien. Ci siamo fermati a far campo lungo una pista che parte da Mahmid e arriva all'Ercigaga, uno dei più grandi deserti del Marocco. Lui è un po' stranita. Ci sono dei fennec qui intorno. Sono delle volpi del deserto, piccole, e con delle grandi orecchie. E spesso le vedi passare al volo anche quando viaggi in fuoristrada in 4x4. In the morning, while we're having breakfast, Luthien brings a new friend to the camp. She must have met him near the aces where I saw her drink. I believe he's very hungry, and I want to give him some cookies. And Luthien asks for some too. During the journey, I stop to visit a small Berber bivouac, while my friends keep going without waiting for me. The bivouac is a campsite made of tents for people, tourists in this case, can relax and drink the classical desert tea. C'è nessuno? Monsieur? 
Dobbiamo risalire al volo. During a short peeing break, a boy suddenly appears out of nowhere from behind a sand dune. Lutian immediately runs to give him a warm welcome. The guy is polite but very shy, and it's us who's got to start chatting. He tells us he's 11 years old, his name is Afi, and he lives in the desert with his family. No, no padre chèvre. Padre chèvre. Alberto and Sabrina give him a pair of shoes, and while we're addressing him a few questions, I give him something to eat. <laughs> In these remote areas of the desert, people don't get to compare themselves very often with the Western world, and whenever they do, they openly ask for what they need. I offer Afi all the tins I can, and after having bowed the way they do, by beating the hand on the heart, he disappears behind the sand dunes. I wear these funny welder glasses because an old friend of mine, Chacho from Trieste, had advised me they were great to protect my eyes from the strong light in the desert. They're bizarre, but unbelievably effective. Good job, Chacho. Fumsguid, the last place before getting our tires back on asphalt. And after approximately 170 kilometers, we reach Warzazet, famous for its movie studios. A large number of renowned directors have shot their films in this worldwide famous place. Just to mention a few movies that you surely know, The Crusades by Ridley Scott, 2005, The Hills of Eyes by Wes Craven, 2007, and Prince of Persia by Michael Bay, 2010. Inside these studios, photography is enriched by the remarkable Moroccan light, while winter shots are very popular amongst directors due to their scare amount of annual rainfall throughout the country. For each movie, the staff fully reconstructs the scenes, leaving them on site until the next production. This is unbelievable. It's lunchtime, and today we are looking forward to rewarding ourselves with typical Moroccan dishes. Facciamo un attimo una pausa per mangiare qualcosa. Ehi tu, lupo! Ciao, lupo, ciao! Bonjour, bonjour! Cosa ci fanno da mangiare? Ci hanno invitato in cucina addirittura. Va bene? Va bene? Raffo, Raffo! Ciao! Piacere! Ah, sono già pronti? Tagine! This dish includes chicken or lamb, but I just don't eat meat. Luckily enough, tagine offers a lot of vegetables, such as potatoes, carrots, celery, and onions. Addirittura ci sono dei ristoranti dove loro ti mettono a disposizione la griglia e tu gli porti la carne e loro ti fanno pagare solo il servizio. 
During our lunch, local musician Mohammed keeps us company with the notes played on a particular instrument resembling a banjo. What a Moroccan atmosphere. We cannot avoid visiting Marrakesh. Every single tourist traveling to Morocco, us included, has to stop there. We're just going to cross it very quickly, but my friends, who have already been there, take me to the main square, the heart of the city, inside the Medina. This is a real set for attractions. In fact, here we meet water sellers, men dressed up in a unique way, selling bottles to tourists, snake charmers, street vendors of any sort, storytellers, and men with little baboons charging tourists for a picture. For a few dirhams, you can also take a horse-drawn carriage ride. It feels like being inside of a large multifamily house, where everyone has a given role and does something. At a certain time, the square kind of switches off itself from the color and drama of the daytime events. The evening lights are turned on, focusing on the night stalls and small portable restaurants which rise every night in the center of the amazing square of this chaotic city. Our last stop to buy some gifts is in Fez, a city nestled on the hills. It is famous for its Medina, where professional craftsmen work in a small crumbling laboratories to produce objects of rare beauty. Its market, rooted within hinged narrow streets on the hills, is much more touristic compared to the previous ones we have visited. I walk through it with Lutian, trying not to frighten the children who, finding themselves facing a dib, Arabic name for the wolf, run away screaming. So why don't you care at all? Ale comes back to mind and I can't help but smile. All in all, it's thanks to him if I ended up traveling with Luthien and acing across this beautiful country. Everything I enjoy and love doing is enclosed in the expectations he has committed me. Indeed, I should swear at him forever, but actually, what should I do more than this? And here we are in Volubilis, a Roman archaeological site located 27 miles north of Meknes. It's the most famous site in Morocco and is listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Walking around the ruins, I almost feel jointed back in the time, and while enjoying the landscape of this beautiful day, I spot two storks making their nest on the capital of a column. This is really something. Unfortunately, in 1755, this Roman city was completely destroyed by an earthquake, and it was only in the 19th century that excavations were undertaken to recover what I'm enjoying today. Walking through the remains of the mosaics and of the basilica, I try to imagine what life must have been like some 1500 years ago, with no cars, no off-road vehicles, no telecommunications, no cameras, and yet how much splendor and engineering in the mosaics and in the architecture of Volubilis. Who knows what the ancient inhabitants would think of my traveling with Luthien. Exceedingly satisfied with this cultural stop, we start off for the last part of our journey.
Shefwan is our last stop before arriving at the port of Tangier. The small town is known for its blue, narrow alleys and mostly for the sale of drugs. At times, tourists seem to be taking advantage of it. We are being approached by people trying to sell us all sorts of substances too, but we categorically reject. We can breathe a captivating Mediterranean atmosphere while walking around the village. It almost feels like being on a Greek little island, where everything is blue. A very strange feeling takes hold of us. So here we are again, heading home. This journey is over. And between sand dunes, night camps, strange encounters and visits to observed places, we got to the end again. I can almost taste these experiences and for sure, we'll all go back home extremely enriched with something I cannot really describe. It's not just a matter of adding an extra destination to my explorations. It's not a question of satisfying my sight and the time spent traveling. These feelings and experiences enrich us from within, making me feel alive. Yeah.